This is a production of Cornell University. For the last three decades, the neoliberal regime has shaped production and consumption in the agriculture and food business. Policies of the new global economy emphasize economic growth through deregulation, market integration, expansion of the private sector, and contraction of the welfare state. Have we now reached some institutional and material limits? Is the neoliberal regime exhausted? Stephen Wolf addresses these questions in a book talk presented at Mann Library in October 2014. His new publication, The Neoliberal Regime in the Agri-Food Sector, co-edited with Alessandro Bonanno, presents an informed, constructive dialogue about the limits of neoliberal policies and grapples with the concepts of regimes, systemic crisis, and transitions. Dr. Wolf is Associate Professor in the Department of Natural Resources in Cornell University's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and Senior Lecturer in the Center for Environmental Policy at Imperial College, University of London, UK. So thanks, Mary, and thanks to Lynn and to others at the library for making this possible, and thanks to you for coming. It's important to recognize that I think the Chat in the Stack series primarily is focusing on authored books. This is an edited book, and so there's a lot of people to acknowledge and also to recognize that my capacity or the appropriateness of having me summarize the entire body of work represented in the book is somewhat limited. And so uh, I will try to provide an overview of the volume as a whole, but I think a considerable amount of the time that I'll be doing the talking will be devoted to presenting the particular empirical work represented in the book that I'm responsible for. And hopefully that piece of the book in relation to my discussion of the larger book will give you a flavor for what this collective project is all about. So briefly, I wanted to present some intellectual history about how this book and my interest in the topic came about. I then wanted to talk about major themes and the kind of structure of the book and the main arguments and what I think are the contributions and significance of the volume. And then I'll talk about my own research and then just say a quick word about future projects, about where this piece of research and the effort with colleagues to produce the book takes us as we look ahead. So, the volume was produced really within the Sociology of Agri-Food Research Interest Group of the Rural Sociological Society. And the Rural Sociological Society, which has a, a rich history, particularly at Cornell University, was celebrating its 75th year. And as part of the 75th year celebration, the research interest groups were encouraged and were quite eager to do something special. And so the idea would be that we would hold a mini-conference, and out of that mini-conference we would produce a book. And this would kind of put an exclamation point and mark historically what people were working on, talking about, and dominant themes of the time. And it was a great opportunity and a privilege to play a leadership role in that event and to recognize that the history of producing edited volumes and hosting mini-conferences in the Rural Sociological Society and specifically in SAFRIG, the Sociology of Agri-Food Research Interest Group, is a standing tradition. And when I was a graduate student at Madison, as Mary pointed out, the 50th anniversary of the Rural Sociological Society had recently occurred. And Bill Friedland and colleagues, including Fred Buttle, who has now passed on, was a, a friend of mine, a mentor, and a faculty member at Cornell before he moved to Wisconsin, with Larry Bush and some of the others who were represented in this book that I'm presenting today, produced toward a new political economy of agriculture, which was, at least for me and maybe for some people in this room, an important book. And it really created and opened up, or at least for me opened up, a line of thinking that was new and exciting. And it had a lot to do with my early career. And then, subsequently, in 1994, Alessandro Bonanno, my co-editor in this book, led a mini-conference which led to the publication of a book that some of you may know, From Columbus to Conagra, which was another very important volume, really speaking to questions of globalization and to trade and to market integration and to regulation theory and questions of trade, environment, labor, sustainability. And that then 
some years later, led to the book that we're here to talk about today. And in mentioning and trying to offer some kind of professional setting, disciplinary um, foundation for this book, it's important not only to recognize the Rural Sociological Society, but also the Agriculture, Food, and Human Values group, the International Sociological Association, specifically RC40, Research Committee 40, which I'm now serving on the executive board, and the International Rural Sociological Association. These groups, which uh, are more international than the Rural Sociological Society, which is self-admittedly limited by its tendency to be domestically focused, represent kind of overlapping and interrelating professional groups, many of the same faces and people, same ideas, but they also have their own distinct traditions and their own intellectual lives. And so I don't want to strictly advertise this as a product of the Rural Sociological Society. More generally, it's a, a field of research in sociology of agri-food, which finds its home in a variety of locations. And I, I hope in this talk I'll give Alessandro Bonanno his due. I really want to talk about his contributions, both in terms of leadership as well as the substantive intellectual contributions. And I will talk about the other authors represented in the book. But this volume that Bill Friedland, who was a Cornell professor in the ILR school before he made his career at Santa Cruz, uh, produced uh, with Larry Bush and with Fred Buttle and Alan Rudy, opened up this new line of conversation. And it was a, a departure for the extent to which sociology of agriculture existed before then. It was, I think, a rather stale and limited affair, quite narrow, I think the dominant question was one of adoption diffusion of technologies, particularly hybrid seed. And the role of sociology was somewhere in a role of market research and trying to understand patterns of adoption or predictors of adoption to enable and catalyze diffusion of technologies which were viewed normatively as good. And that tradition gave way, perhaps as a function of history. And if you're thinking about what was happening in this period of the late 70s and early 80s when the new political economy of agriculture got off the ground. We had the environmental movement on the one hand and we had a rural crisis and a farm crisis with tremendous consolidation in this country of farms and farm ownership and the number of farms and the size of farms and the structure of agriculture was changing. And many of these folks were interested in those social problems and created a new field, a new, a new literature. And I think it's important to recognize the institutional home for this field was largely land-grant universities. And that, of course, is a good thing. Uh, but it also, perhaps, uh, can be viewed as limiting. That the questions that might be relevant and were relevant and really got a hold and were institutionalized in this new political economy of agriculture would be questions really on the production side. Land, technology, environment, labor. These were the questions that anchored the literature and formed it. And in some ways, I think we could even say limited it. Limited it. And so in the Rural Sociological Society, we're quite interested in how can it be that everyone's interested in food and agriculture, but no one has read our work, right? There's all this new interest in food and in agriculture. And by and large, I think without being disrespectful, it's passed us by. And I think perhaps because the focus on consumption, which is relatively new, is not something that was there in the beginning, and it's not something really well represented historically, at least in my reading of land grants, at least at the time that this body of research started. And also I think that the new political economy of agriculture was quite domestically focused, in, or at least focused on advanced capitalist countries, and it didn't engage substantially with questions of development and to its detriment, as now the literature has really moved on. And there's a big, vibrant literature out there, which we can say charitably is complementary, is parallel. But in some ways, these folks who were really there at the inception, and I wasn't, I'm too young for that, they're at the inception, have not really been part of that ongoing and exciting body of work. But maybe they can claim some role in its founding. So just to be clear, behind this book lay a conference. And behind that mini-conference lay the annual meeting of the Rural Sociological Society. There were a large number of papers, 22 represented. We shared drafts on the internet, so we came to that meeting having read each other's work, and we had two days of intensive back and forth, and a, a good time and a good intellectual exchange. And out of that, Alessandro Bonanno and I chose the papers and revised them and made a contract with Rutledge EarthScan to bring 
the book to press. And I think it's just important, particularly for students in the room, to realize that professional societies offer these publishing opportunities. I think when I show you the group of authors, you won't recognize, but a third of them are late stage graduate students, a third of them are like myself, mid-career, and a third of them are very senior kind of leaders in the field. And so it's a nice opportunity to just point out that some of the intellectual and professional development opportunities through participating in professional societies. It's also useful to note that you were not required to be a member of the Rural Sociological Society to attend the meeting or contribute a paper, and several people, people whose papers in the book are not members or active in SAFRIG. And so on the one hand, we're closed, on the other hand, we're open. But I encourage you to get in, involved, if not in rural sociology, but in any of the other societies that meet your needs. So the scope of the book, the kind of reason and the genesis of the book, that I think it's fair to say that the authors largely share a commitment and an interest in social problems, and we use agri-food and agri-food sociology as a way in to say something and learn something and try to contribute to understanding and redress of social problems. That the problems of environment, the problems of labor, the problems of land and its distribution and use, the problems of rural vitality and community economic development, problems of technology and technology assessment and problems of policy. Those categories uh, cut across agriculture and food, but they also go beyond it. And so in some ways the book is very much about agriculture and food, but in other ways it's very much about a set of social problems. The research tools and theories that we can bring to bear on those problems, as well as the institutional foundations for those problems, as well as the solutions, both in terms of opportunities and constraints. And so on the one hand, it's a book about sociology of agri-food, and the other hand, it's really a book about much larger questions. And that's really where the question of neoliberalism and crisis come in. I think that our intention, I think many people would recognize that the debate about neoliberalism uh, is sometimes a rather stale debate or an ideological debate where you have different factions or ideologies who talk at or past each other. And we really tried not to do that, whether we succeeded or not is up to you. The aim was to try to empirically engage questions of modes of regulation, of governance, questions of the state, questions of market rule, applied to agriculture and food, applied to questions of labor, applied, applied to questions of sustainability, applied to questions of production, marketing, and trade. What is the state as we look both globally and locally in situated places and contextualized cases as well as kind of aggregated analysis? What can we say about the fruits of neoliberalism, the fruits of a program of market reforms over the last, say, 25 years, and what might be the limits? And I'll say a little bit about that in just a moment. So our uh, intention was not to write another book saying how bad neoliberalism is, how short-sighted the neoliberals are. We've got to find an alternative, up with the state, down with the market. We really tried to go beyond that. And whether we succeeded or not, again, is up to you. So I want to briefly just put a foundation under the conversation by saying something about neoliberalism. That a brief history in Larry Bush's chapter two in the book does this quite nicely. And the foundations, according to Larry, uh, can be traced back to 1938 with a colloquium in Paris organized by public intellectuals at the time who were concerned really about overreaching states. They were concerned about fascism, Stalinism, Nazism, and also in Western democracies in a growing state apparatus which crowded out for them the individuals and the sovereignty of individuals. So they wanted to rescue the classical liberal tradition through a program of what they came to call neoliberalism. And one of the champions was Hayek, and Hayek was advertising and advocating for a positive program of laissez-faire. So it's not, let's minimize the state and move them off to the side and marginalize the state in order to make space for the market, but it's an active program of enlisting the state in rolling back and rolling out programs that made it possible to institutionalize market rules, market logic, market calculus, and market mechanisms to coordinate flows of resources, flows of capital, flows of material goods, and flows of information. 
and here you see Hayek, Lippmann, Polanyi, and I guess it's a copy of his book. I didn't put Milton Friedman up there because Milton Friedman came later. And the tenets of neoliberalism, which I've um, borrowed and uh, developed from Larry Bush's arguments, could be summarized as follows. The program is one is to recognize the limits of individuals' ability to make sense of the world and to do the calculus necessary to allocate resources. And so it's an explicit critique of centralized planning of bureaucracies as a mechanism for economic planning and development. And it's explicitly an argument for market relations with the idea that markets synthesize vast amounts of information at speeds and efficiencies and effectiveness that bureaucracies cannot do. And so it's a celebration of the information integration power of markets. And so the role of government should be to shape opportunities for market or quasi-market like institutions in the program of neoliberalism. And we can go further and suggest that neoliberalism also is a program of identifying individuals as entrepreneurs, as self-actualized, and really minimizing the contextualization or notions of embeddedness or our role in collectives of communities and really to celebrate individuals again in the classical liberal tradition. And so neoliberalism is often summarized as an anti-state position and a pro-market position and in some ways that's valid or useful but it's also limited. The neoliberal position classically was one of recognizing and celebrating or calling and advocating for the state to be an active partner in the realization of market rule. And so neoliberalism can be viewed as an ideology, it can be viewed as a political program of enrolling actors and building constituencies and making arguments over time. It can be viewed as a general reference, and this is the way that I want to try to emphasize neoliberalism. Personally, and Alessandro Bonanno and I differ a bit on this, I think competition is quite useful. I think it's quite important. I think it's quite valid. I think the opportunities of using market logic and market tools have uh, been demonstrated. And at the same time, I think that enthusiasm in some quarters is way overstated. And we need a correction. And that correction can come from both civil society and the state. Maybe it could come from science as well. But the idea of a general reference to neoliberalism as a program of historical ideas, of reform, as an idea of fashioning both the public and the private and the social spheres as subject to evolutionary pressures, to selection pressures, to interest and demand for efficiency and accountability, some of those things are quite positive. Many of them can be taken to extremes and have been. And in that straw man role, when we just view as neoliberalism as something that we're going to tear down because it doesn't work, because it's not fair, because it's not sustainable, because it's not just. Those also are represented in the intellectual history of neoliberalism in the contemporary time. And in some ways, I think it would be fair to say all three of these are represented in the volume as well. So on with the book. So the authors. A terrific group of people that I really enjoyed working with who did in fact adhere to deadlines, who did undertake revisions as guided by the editors diligently and in a timely fashion and I think that the book shows great attention to detail and effort and investment by each of the individual authors. As I mentioned before, a very diverse group both nationally, I can't say we had great disciplinary diversity, the vast majority are working in sociology departments, but that's uh, Fair, fair enough. Um, question of career stage, question of gender, lots to celebrate in terms of bringing different people to bear, people who had not worked together previously, and it was a lot of fun and successful in that respect. In terms of geographic scope of the book, not bad. It is US centric, but we have plenty of international coverage, which gives us some purchase on a more international and cosmopolitan perspective. And with that, I want to now turn to my particular piece in the book. And my interest is really in trying to understand what it means to argue that agri-environmental policy, so natural resource conservation and agriculture, 
is subject to neoliberal controls or in some ways are being increasingly subject to a neoliberalization. And empirically, I'm evaluating what's happening in the United States, but also in Europe, in terms of the calls for, pressures for, the co-optation of, and the implementation of market-based policy schemes in conservation, in agricultural policy. And so, conceptually or theoretically, the argument is that history matters and that institutional change is hard to come by. Just because it may be fair to say that neoliberalism has been the dominant tendency over 30 years, in agriculture there's a bit of a paradox. Agriculture on the one hand gives a lot of rhetoric and symbolic uh, gestures to free markets and market-based approaches to dealing with regulation and coordination. On the same, at the same time, both in Europe and the United States, Agriculture enjoys great state protections, tremendous subsidies, and investments, both in terms of research and development, training, trade, infrastructure, and direct uh, cash transfer. And so agriculture's relationship with neoliberalism or with market rule, I think, is paradoxical, or at least it's not clear. We can say it's ambiguous. And when we think about the idea that the conservation piece of agri-food has been subject to a neoliberal turn, my story is going to be a bit different. I think that we can say that the history of agri-environmental policy, that is payments made by government to farmers or landowners in return for producing public goods in the form of water quality, biodiversity, or now increasingly perhaps carbon sequestration, are not governed by market principles. They're governed largely by bureaucratic and political bargains that have been struck in the past. And so to the extent that people would like to see or perhaps would like to argue that agriculture is subject to neoliberal rule, the conservation sphere throws a monkey wrench in such, in such arguments. And the logic of the uh, explanation is that there is this stickiness, that history and path dependence matter. That Laws, knowledge, relationships, policy networks, discourses, justifications, all of these things arose to justify, to structure, and to sustain conservation payments to farmers in a historical period in where the state was in the center of the network, not the market, and not market calculus. And increasingly there have been calls, and I'm doing research on this explicitly with a variety of colleagues, to use more rationality, more data, more and better models to try to enhance the efficiency and the effectiveness of doing conservation in agriculture. But it's a tough set of arguments and innovations to introduce. And that's because of the embedded institutional character of agriculture and particularly conservation in agriculture. So AEP, Agri-Environmental Policy, is historically, for our purposes, most importantly, a state-centered, politically structured set of affairs. That the role of market thinking, market tools, is somewhat limited, historically. And as Clive Potter and I have argued, that agri-environmental policy is the major source of funding for conservation on private lands, that's true in Europe and in the United States, and for our purposes, it stands as a classic example of second best policies. And that is to say that the policies are uh, serving a variety of functions in the political sphere. So although they're referred to as conservation policies, although people might like to believe they're conservation policies, they're much more than that. They do address questions of environmental degradation, but very importantly, Agri-environmental payments in agriculture in Europe and the United States have served to boost farm incomes and to manage supply, oversupply, that is. And so the historical moment when conservation payments were institutionalized in these countries was a time of a farm crisis, an income crisis, and a crisis of oversupply. And the response was to craft a variety of conservation programs that served all of these objectives. And uh, the argument in the chapter that I offer 
spells out how difficult it is to separate out this first bullet point, environmental degradation, from the other two bullet points. And so programs of reform, programs of rationalization <coughs> along lines of neoliberalism run into barriers. And those barriers largely arise because of historical embedded justifications, discourses, networks, and knowledge. And if we take an example, the Conservation Reserve Program, the largest piece of the US conservation portfolio. Right now, I think it's a 27 million acres. It has been as high as 32 million acres. That's 10% of our crop base and the cost of $2 billion per year. And here's the geographic distribution of lands in 1993, eight years after the program began. Here's the distribution of 2013. The program continues. And we asked the question about spatial targeting. So we're interested in the question, how do specific tracts of land get subject to being taken out of production for purposes of protecting water quality, reducing soil erosion, enhancing wildlife, and so forth? How do we do selection? And what's well recognized and has been critiqued now for 25 years is that the Conservation Reserve Program was not subject to scientized, rationalized, economized eligibility requirements nor selection criteria. It was in the initial period really a first come first serve affair. And over time there were critiques and there were reforms that institutional changes and scoring algorithms like the Environmental Benefits Index were introduced to try to introduce some elements of assessment, efficiency, with an eye towards productivity enhancements to trying to get a bigger bang for the buck, more value for taxpayer dollars. But at the very same time, there are lots of constraints on such a program that might be considered a program of neoliberalization. So agri-environmental policy was subject to a variety of talk about movement towards outcome-based instruments or productivity enhancements and using market discipline to enhance geographic targeting and spatial rationalization. And similarly, there's been lots of talk and critiques of the knowledge base and the science base underlying conservation and the rationale and justification and legitimacy of payments to farmers for conservation. All of that stuff is not new. It's been happening for 25 years. The responses in the policy environment are varied, but we can identify a whole variety of demands on policymakers and on agriculture as a whole. A demand to shore up the science base, a demand to secure the legitimacy of making payments to farmers, and to demonstrate effectiveness, efficiency, and equity. And in the public administration literature, the new public management ideas, I think, are quite relevant. This graphic's, of course, comical. Um, I think they haven't even bothered to hold the rope ho holding the guy who's digging the hole. But the idea being that new public management thinking, which I think is linked very much to neoliberal thinking, would have agricultural, uh, agri-environmental policy structured quite differently. And specifically, there'd be something called a purchaser-provider split, where the USDA and the farmers would be less embedded with one another, would have a less collegial relationship, and they'd have perhaps a more of a buyer and seller relationship. Similarly, what the public services or what the ecosystem services in modern parlance would be would be specified with greater detail and the contracts that would be used to secure these uh, goods and to mediate the exchange of money for value would be tightened up. But the idea of using what we would call payments for ecosystem services where you would separate the buyer and the seller, you would specify in great detail the additionality or the conditionality under which payments would be made to farmers and subjecting farmers as well as bureaucrats to market discipline through a program of modeling, of science, of outcome-based policy or a program of neoliberalism, all in the name of efficiency and innovation has run into tremendous stumbling blocks in the United States. And so traditionally, agri-environmental policy has been organized historically by the USDA and the Natural Resource Conservation Service in solidarity with farmers. The USDA has not had a split from farmers. They've been partners, is their own language. Similarly, payments for environmental services has been subject to vast 
standardization. There hasn't been a lot of commodification and payments for individual volumes or quantities or qualities of ecosystem services. There's been payment schedules. And again, payment schedules, solidarity between buyers and sellers does not look like new public management. It does not look like neoliberalism. And so we're left with a paradox which asks us to tackle the question, how can we on the one hand imagine that agriculture is subject to neoliberal pressures and yet agri-environmental policy seems to be stuck in a period of the mid-80s or perhaps the 90s subject to incremental reforms. There are calls for liberalization and there is some experimentation to move to a more economistic, a more market focused, a more outcome based footing for making payments to farmers, but that those efforts are quite sparse. They exist as pilot programs on the margin of agri-environmental policy. And we do see, I think, more empirically and perhaps more positively, some blending. It's not a question that market tendencies have been pushed out and state bureaucratic norms have remained uh, unadulterated over time. We have seen mixing, blending of old knowledge and new knowledge, blending of public and private, lots of uh, evidence of reform, but very slow, almost glacial. And it begs the question of could this crisis applied to agri-environmental policy, could the demands for reform, could the demands for more effective and more efficient investments in conservation and agriculture give rise to rupture? Could we see radical reforms? Could we see private and privatization of markets for ecosystem services and agricultural landscapes. The empirical observations suggest it's not happening. The ideas of a vast neoliberal turn raise the question of can this statist corner uh, stand the test of time? And that's really where that chapter leaves that question. And so back to the volume as a whole. The book asks the question of crisis. Do we have a crisis of neoliberalism? How would we know we have a crisis of neoliberalism? Clearly we had the financial meltdown of 2008. Food riots have been abundantly documented. Land grabs, which may be a signal of scarcity, again, are well documented. There's lots of evidence that agri-food and other parts of the mode of regulation centered on market logic is up against limits. But at the same time, the crisis stems not just from material recognition of we have problems. The crisis has two other dimensions which are important. One is a recognition that the model itself has internal contradictions. And that is, it's hard to sustain the legitimacy of a model based on increasing liberalization as solving our problems, when many of our problems seem to be quite collective. So deepening commitments to atomization and individualization does not seem to tackle the need for collective action at a variety of scales, both global scale, national scale, and local scale. So can we fix this problem by going deeper into individualized explanations and individualized interventions? And additionally, the crisis has the dimension of we don't seem to have any functional alternatives. Where some say we're going to rescue the commons. Some say we're going to have some kind of pragmatic democracy. Some say we're going to re-legitimate the state. Some say religion and spirituality is going to save us. Some say the state is going to be subject to new politics. But all of those ideas in the book seem to also be quite limited, particularly in the area of empirical evidence of their viability. And so the crisis has this material dimension of failing to deliver the goods and solve social problems. But the crisis also has in it the question of its capability to solve the problems, which it either fails to respond to or is responsible for itself. And lastly, we don't seem to have any viable alternatives to neoliberal rule. And in this sense, the crisis is both material and discursive. And in terms of alternatives to neoliberalism, the book, I think, does not do as good a job as it could, and that's where this last, I, I think, slide is going to take us in terms of our next project, Alessandro Bonanno and I, 
are trying to work on a project in the future to try to turn explicitly to this question of what do we know about alternatives and what types, types of responses could we advocate for and should we experiment with. And that is, in 2016 in Toronto, there'll be a large meeting of a lot of folks who have been studying with us and sharing a literature. And Alessandro and I are interested in joining others to explore the question of resistance and accommodation in agri-food studies, particularly this question of trying to critique in a thoughtful and empirically validated way what we perceive to be a turn towards a tendency to ask individuals through reflexive consumption and ethical shopping, as well as a tendency to individuate the responsibility for solving problems of justice and sustainability. And so Alessandro and I believe very strongly that these approaches are quite limited and are not going to take us where we need to go. And so we want to critique these ideas of a kind of shopping our way out of this mess. And secondly, we want to raise the question of accountability and explore what could be lying inside the concept of accountability at levels of organization above individuals. So accountability applied to sectors, firms, nation, nations or territories to examine the possibility of diversity and accountability and a set of practices that might offer some alternatives. But of course, accountability and this idea of responsabilization are quite close together. And so we're going to play with that idea together as we look forward. So thanks very much. And I hope we have time to have a brief discussion around neoliberalism in the book. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.